so in the previous video we were talking about the oxygen dissociation curve and what we've learned about the oxygen dissociation curve at least the most obvious thing is the shape of it okay the shape is kind of sigmoid or it is also referred to as an s-shaped curve um as you can see there i'm just showing you how the curve looks like right that's the s-shape right there so the first thing we have to understand about the S-shaped curve is to give ourselves a situation. Now, I don't need you to memorize this part at least. I'll tell you which part to, uh, you need to memorize. But the problem with this part of the chapter uh, is the fact that I do need to give a bit of explanation. In my situation over here, imagine for a second there are a few lung alveoli that I'm drawing at the top and blood capillary at the bottom of the alveolus because that's where gas exchange happens. Now, for example, with my oxygen dissociation graph over here, if let's say there are four situations where the lung alveolus have, uh, has two kilopascals of oxygen, four kilopascals of oxygen, six and also eight kilopascals of oxygen. Now, for example, let's say when the red blood cell passes the lung alveolus, with two kilopascals of oxygen, it will have an oxygen saturation of 20%. So what I love to do is I would love to ask my students this question. If two kilopascals of oxygen gives you 20% saturation, um, what will four kilopascals give you? Then most students will say, well, if two gives me 20%, four gives me 40%, six kilopascals give me 60%, and eight kilopascals give me 80%. So if I were to plot a graph of oxygen saturation against partial pressure of oxygen, I will get a linear line or a straight line. So this is a problem because the oxygen dissociation curve is a curve, it's not a straight line. What that means is, so this is wrong. So what happens in reality? In reality, something slightly different takes place. What happens is the partial pressure of oxygen still remains the same, 2 kilopascals, 4, 6, and 8 kilopascals of oxygen. Okay, So 2 kilopascals of oxygen will still give me 20%, which is fine. Okay, So let's plot that in the graph. But 4 kilopascals of oxygen, instead of giving me 40% oxygen saturation, it actually gives me 60%. There is a sudden sharp increase in the percentage oxygen saturation of the red blood cell. So the question is, is this good or is this bad? This is extremely good because you want your red blood cells to be carrying as much oxygen as possible to your body cells because your body cells constantly need oxygen. So the more you fill up the red blood cells with oxygen, the better. And lucky for us, the hemoglobin behaves in such a way. If the graph was linear, 4 kilopascals will only give us a 40% saturation. But because it's a curve, 4 kilopascals of oxygen gives us 60% oxygen saturation. I would like to remind you again that these values are theoretical. Different species and even amongst different people, the oxygen dissociation curve is slightly different. So these values of Two, 2 giving us 20%, 4 kilopascals giving us 60%. These values you don't need to memorize. The part that I just want you to memorize, at least the first part at least, is a small increase in the partial pressure of oxygen will give us a large increase in the percentage oxygen saturation. Uh, that is why you'll get the S-shaped curve. But of course, then the question in the exam is, why is it a curve? Why does hemoglobin behave in such a way? The reason is because, okay, so let's start again. When the lung alveoli only has two kilopascals of oxygen, what happens is the, there is a low amount of oxygen and some of the oxygen wants to bind with the heme group. Here's the weird thing about hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. I've drawn out that hemoglobin there for you, and those, red, those four red dots represent the heme group, and there is an oxygen molecule near it, O2. Do you see that? So the oxygen wants to bind to the heme group, 
but the heme group is kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's hidden, it's hidden or it's shrouded by the polypeptide chains, which are those green and purple color, uh, circular, squiggly things that I've drawn around the heme group. Okay, so the oxygen molecule has difficulty binding to the heme group, right? So a lot of students assume just because I have oxygen, it will automatically bind to the heme group. That is a wrong assumption, okay? Oxygen has difficulty binding to the first heme group because all the heme groups are hidden within the polypeptide chains. So we would say here that the affinity of oxygen and the heme group is low, which I'm drawing out to be like a small heart shape over there. So they have like a small attraction to each other, which means to say it takes at least two kilopascals of oxygen to make sure at least that the hemoglobin is 25% saturated. What that means, I don't need you to memorize that part. I just need you to understand that to make sure that at least one, heme, uh, one oxygen molecule binds to the heme group, we need at least two kilopascals of oxygen. That is what the graph is saying, okay? Don't, and I'm putting an, a reminder that don't memorize that part. Now, the next part is the important one for the exam, and that is the one that you need to understand and memorize and explain it again if the questions ask you. As you can see, when the first oxygen molecule binds to the heme group, notice what happens to the shape of the hemoglobin. You are right, the shape of the hemoglobin becomes distorted. So you might be thinking, oh shit, if the oxygen distorts the shape of the hemoglobin, which is a protein, every time proteins get distorted, this is bad, the 3D structure changes. In this case, it's not necessarily a bad thing because look at what happens to the second heme group. The second heme group is no longer hidden by the polypeptide chains. It is now exposed. When it is exposed, it makes it easier for the second oxygen molecule to bind to the second heme group. So two kilopascals of oxygen gives you 25% okay, uh, oxygen saturation, but you don't need four kilopascals of oxygen to reach a 50% saturation you might just need 2.5 kilopascals of oxygen accumulatively. So because the second oxygen molecule has a higher affinity for the second heme group, that is why a small increase in the partial pressure of oxygen from 2 to 2.5 causes a large increase in the oxygen saturation from 25% to 50%. And that's a good thing, okay? So you don't need a lot of oxygen molecules to saturate your hemoglobin. And then once the second oxygen molecule binds to the second heme group, same thing happens for the third heme group. High affinity, it makes it easier, and it keeps on going with the fourth heme group. So a small increase in the oxygen Partial pressure will cause a large increase in the percentage oxygen saturation because when the first oxygen molecule binds to the um, heme group, uh, it distorts the shape of hemoglobin, it exposes the second one, and then it exposes the third one, and it exposes the fourth heme group, making it easier for subsequent oxygen molecules to bind to it. That's basically what you need to explain for the exam. So to summarize, a small increase in partial pressure of oxygen makes it causes a large increase in percentage oxygen saturation. The reason is because when oxygen binds to the first heme group, it distorts the hemoglobin, exposing the second heme group, and the second heme group will have a higher affinity for oxygen, making it easier to bind to oxygen. That's all we need to know for the exam.